Hello and welcome to this download from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller, and my guest is Michael McNay, author of a sumptuously illustrated guidebook to the country's best-kept secrets in the form of art and architecture, from statues you might walk past every day without looking at, on Platform 1 of Paddington Station, for example, to masterpieces of art buried deep within museums that lie far from the beaten track. I asked Michael first how he decided what counted as a hidden treasure. It was very much um, off the cuff. There are obviously some fairly famous places. I mean, for instance, I've got Westminster Abbey in and Westminster mm. Cathedral mm. and the Cotel Institute. It, it qualified either because, I mean, I think the best example is Westminster Abbey, where the tomb of Henry the Seventh is completely anonymous as far as the church itself is concerned. There's no attribution to the artist, but the artist happens to be Pietro Torrigiano, former student alongside um, Michelangelo and notorious for breaking Michelangelo's nose. And indeed, that's why he finished up in England as part of a sort of peripatetic European existence, making mm. a living elsewhere. But, but other things, I mean, there's also the statue of... Um, of Charles I at the top of Whitehall at Trafalgar yes. Square and well although millions of people see it nobody looks at it yes. well, you know, nobody in quotes and so it varied from that to objects like the monument to um, a bare fist bare knuckle champion of England Tom Spring in his native village in uh, Herefordshire I wondered, you mentioned you mentioned a couple of examples in London there, and I wondered if London presented a, a different sort of challenge, or if in fact it's, it's easier to hide things, so to speak, in, in a, such a big city compared to a, a smaller location. I suppose so, I suppose so, yes. I mean, it's like a person being lost in a crowd, isn't it? Mm. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff that is just taken as part of the everyday scene and taken for granted. So really, it was a movable feast. I was, I, I, I made it up as I went along. I mean, I was, I was reminded of the old cliche about the best place to hide information being a library, and um, thinking about galleries. And often, you, you recommend, you know, just one painting in a particular gallery, and it may be a, a gallery which doesn't have a, an especially distinguished collection overall. But you, you, you know, will single out a particular painting and recommend the visitor homes in and yes. goes to see that. Yes. Yes, I think, I mean, for instance, Hull um, is a very good example because um, they have a Franz Hals there, which is a magnificent portrait. It's one of his best, I think. Uh, and indeed, it was in the big Hals exhibition at the Royal Academy in the 90s. A very beautiful picture in the city. Well, Hull, by its very nature, is actually a big city, though it is. And important, it's off the beaten track. Um, you know, nobody going north goes through Hull or even near it has a fine collection anyway, but the house is absolutely outstanding. And I don't think, I mean, most people I spoke to had no idea um, this painting was there. I, w- I really liked the personal tone of the book, because obviously you could have decided to write it in a very po-faced, encyclopedic reference style, but I really like the, the personal touches. You, you get a sense of you being there and visiting. You Talking about Chasselton Manor House in Oxfordshire, for example, you describe the fact that you discovered it all my, by chance because you were lost and looking for Chasselton Village. It started off that way, and it seemed a good idea to keep that up, partly because the variety of stuff is so enormous. So I'm not an art historian talking to um, a dedicated readership. It's, it's much more general than that. I thought as I went round that if you find an extraordinarily florid compliment to a recently dead person in his memorial in a church, I found it was quite useful if you could draw back the curtain and see what other people, you know, a different kind of reality, thought of, of this person. I mean, there's one in Maiden Bradley, for instance, where... The chap commemorated was um, Sir Edward Seymour. I expect the uh, children of uh, the father are really um, thinking in terms of the the whole family rather than the single person. So they totally overlook whatever faults he may have. As it happens, because he was a contemporary of Pepys and it was a small world, and as a powerful local uh, magnet, he uh, operated in London in the Houses of Parliament, so Pepys knew him. Hmm. And Pepys's account of them is very, very different indeed. Hmm. So you've got those sort of interesting um, sidelights, which I think are quite important if you're talking about um, localities. Yes, I mean, I, I really like the fact that you, you're not interested in the art object 
in isolation from the context in which it's produced and you really enjoy the human story. So you, you look behind the object, as it were, to talk about the people who commissioned it or who made it or who sold it or who collected it. I mean, that's, that's clearly part of the, the joy of the project for you. Yes, it was. It was. But the biggest joy, it has to be said, was, were the objects themselves. I mean, the initial things I'd never seen before. I'd never, for some reason, been to Malmesbury before. And the uh, the two um, sculptures in the porch there, of well, six apostles on each side of the porch with angels above, an angel flying above. They're such powerful and wonderful pieces of art. I mean, absolutely, I would say, among the best in England anywhere. That was a tremendous sort of pleasure coming across um, that kind of object. It's interesting to think about how certain buildings may go out or come into fashion again. You you write about the Hoover factory on the A40 as you yes. as you leave um, London, and you quote Sir Nicholas Pevsner's view of it, which was pretty much condemnatory, yes. and how that was revised by in, in a later edition by a, a later editor. And I thought it was interesting yes. to think how how things like that could be could be seen at one time as a an eyesore and at the time be looked on quite nostalgically. Yes, that's right. I mean, part of the thing was, of course, that Pevsner, who uh, obviously was a polymath and magnificent historian, but he was fighting a battle and he was fighting a battle on behalf of modernism and he wanted modern architecture to be recognized as, I suppose, the great art of the 20th century, great applied art anyway. So things like the Hoover Building, which were extravagant, bad taste, extraordinary kind of pop colours, got up his nose. But things have moved on, you know, in art as well. I mean, you get pop art, which was really um, a bunch of artists who were fed up with um, the grand view of art as um, personal expression. And from from one sort of example of maybe bad taste, I, I wanted to ask you about the National Trust, because at one point in the book, you talk about the National Trust for all its virtues laying, uh, you say, the dead hand of good taste on all its houses. And I wondered if you thought there was a there was a real issue there about it sort of funneling our views of the past through this sort of lens of, of impeccable good taste and curatorship. I I don't particularly want to do the National Trust down on this because they do a fantastic job. There is that danger, obviously, and I think things often do look a bit um, Laura Ashley-ish. That is, the, it, it, the, anybody restoring a National Trust house now, however hard they try, is influenced a bit by interior design, uh, middle-class interior design, I might say, you know, of the uh, late 20th century. So, yes, but the National Trust got to... Uh, tremendous lengths to uh, long arguments about whether they should strip away later accretions or leave them because it's part of the history of the house and it's quite a tough decision to make and they do it on an individual basis. Michael, in the process of researching and writing the book, I wondered if there was one discovery that you made, something you hadn't seen before that really stood out and knocked your socks off, so to speak. Yes, in Bucker Newton in Dorset, um, which is actually below the um, famous uh, Abbas man. It's a little church of the Ho- Holy Rood, um, and it contains Merovingian um, sculpture, i.e. something like the year 700, or earlier even, 7th or 8th centuries. And it's not much more than an ideograph, i.e. you recognize a man, but it's almost as though it was... Um, it was something painted for a signpost, you know, or for the gents or something of that sort, mm. except, except that it's clearly an iconic figure, and it is, in fact, Christ, uh, but it's a tremendously warlike-looking Christ, and very powerful, because the sculptured forms, the masses and, and uh, the shapes are, are so condensed, and they speak. I mean, it's the sort of thing that modern artists, you know, Picasso, Braque, were after, I mean, would it, they, I'm convinced if other than they'd seen that, they would have been tremendously excited. So, yeah, they, that, I think that was the most outstanding thing of the stuff I'd not already seen before. <laughs> 